any modes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'll try and go a bit more slowly. I've not got quite as much material. This is a. <laughs> it was. Um, when Barbara said, would I be willing to give a talk on grief? I said, yeah, that, that, that interesting topic. Um, said, oh, 90 minutes. I was thinking, oh. <laughs> so th there'll be plenty of time for questions. Um, but I want to take you through, because this is actually a really, really important topic. And it's perhaps surprising it's not spoken about much more. Just out of interest, just a quick show of hands. How many of you think you've experienced grief in one of the, the animals that you've cared for? Okay, about half. Okay, so um, I, I kept my hand down. I, I don't think I have in any of the animals that we've uh, I've owned over the years that I've I've seen it. But um, and it it is very variable, and something I will return to uh, several times is the expression of grief as f in um, certainly companion animals. I think is very much dependent on both the relationship between uh, the animal's concern, but also their personality as well. But there's also a whole load of other stuff that goes into the mix, which means you can get grief-like responses, uh, changes in owner behavior, which may have nothing to do with grief as well. And I just want to explore the, um, explore the subject with you, I'll tell you a few stories. This is perhaps the most famous monument to uh, companion animal grief in the UK. It's a dog called Greyfriars Bobby. And like many of things in relation to uh, grief, things are not necessarily as they seem. So Greyfriars Bobby, th this is from Edinburgh. And the story goes that this little dog, um, after his owner died, he uh, laid on the grave. And if you, depending on which version of the story you read, it, it, there's certainly a lot more to it. So for a long time, it was thought that he was a Sky Terrier. And then people say, well, actually, round about that time, Sky Terriers were limited to the Isle of Skye. Um, so he couldn't have been a Sky Terrier, so he must have been something else. And recently, people have started to look into the story of Greyfriars Bobby. And I mean, the, the original story suggests that he laid on the grave for 14 years. Now, that's a long time. And as people started to look into it, so it became apparent that Greyfriars Bobby seemed to change form over the years. <laughs> and almost certainly what they think happened is that, yes, a dog uh, th there were quite a few cemetery dogs in uh, in those times. This was in the 19th century. And they actually made cemeteries more approachable to people. And the story goes that the person um, that or the, the person in charge of the cemetery where Greyfriars Bobby was, um, he became quite a, uh, a sensation. So people would come and it did the local economy quite a lot of good. And so when the original Greyfriars Bobby passed on or was about to pass on, a new dog came to lie on the grave <laughs> and they trained another dog. And there may have been three or four Greyfriars Bobbies. Um, and in particular, the person who was in charge of the cemetery, people would often bring meals for him as well because he'd be looking over the dog. Um, and it's a f I think it's a fascinating story. In fact, I think it's more interesting than the um, romantic version of the story. And as I said, as with most things in relation to grief, there's always these extra little complications, as we'll see as we go through. But uh, if ever you're in Edinburgh, um, go and have a look at Greyfriars Bobby. Um, so you occasionally see these sorts of headlines um, in, the, in the news. And this is one from a, f a few years ago, five years ago, actually. Heartbreaking moment, dog helps to bury his dead brother after he's hit by car. And the story goes that this is, this is the brother, um, and the, um, the family went to bury him, and then the dog came along, and he started to shuffle the soil in as well. Um, and they, they reported on it. There was a thing just a few weeks ago, I don't know if any of you saw it, about a dog on a railway line that got injured in America. So. Um, a feral dog on a 
a railway line got evidently got hit by a train and it was quite seriously injured and its companion wouldn't leave it. Uh, it was still alive and it w when a train came, the companion would lie on top of it and push it down so the trains could safely pass. Um, and this went on for quite a while until the rescuers came in. The rescuers initially could not get anywhere near because the, um, the companion would protect the injured dog as well. And I think this is sort of testament to the strength of the bonds that dogs form. Um, and I'm going to talk about cats as well. And it, it's interesting, the, the data on cats, actually. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. But one of the things that strikes me about dogs is we've selected dogs to have this very close relationship with people. Um, and unfortunately, that means you can get away with abusing dogs terribly and they'll still love you, um, it seems. So, um, but you know that potentially comes at a cost when relationships break down. Exactly what a dog intends when it does something like this, we really have no I idea, you know? Um, but as I hope to show you sort of in the course of the next hour or so, you know, clearly, you know, something is going on. Um, and we need to perhaps be more aware of it um, and do what we can to help. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit about what we mean by grief in companion animals and also what we don't, because um, I think that's quite important, because there's lots of things that are wrapped up in this whole grieving process um, um, or response to loss. Um, that we just need to tease out because it does have important implications when we think about what needs to do. But I, I want to argue that this is not just a reaction to owners. Um, and I, I'll say we see it in wild animals as well. And one of the problems sometimes with science, science can be very conservative and people don't want to um, accept some ideas um, but, as I'll show you, grief in itself doesn't actually require high levels of cognition. And, you know, I've, I've done a fair bit of work of, on cognition over the years, and the more I do work on cognition in dogs, the more I'm convinced that dogs actually cognitively are not that complicated. But they are very tuned into emotion, and they are also very, very observant, and they can make powerful predictions as a result. So dogs can look incredibly smart, and it depends what your definition of smart is, but they don't carry a lot of mental complex baggage with it. So, you know, you might be worried, or I might be worried about my flight home. Is it going to, is it going to turn up because I'm flying with Ryanair? Um, dogs don't worry about things like that. They worry about the fact that that bit of food's just fallen out of my bowl and it's, it's rolled down the stairs, you know, and I'm going to have to go and get it. Um, and that doesn't take any of the mystery away. I, I, one of my friends once said to me, sort of, well, didn't I find doing the, the work on cognition a bit like unmasking the magician? You know, once you see how a trick's done. And I said, well, you know, just because dogs don't necessarily use sophisticated methods of thinking, Realizing that they're incredibly observant and perhaps they're responding to other cues, to me, is just as amazing. And I don't want to take anything away from them, but um, we did an experiment a few years ago uh, with some colleagues in Brazil. And to cut a long story short, we basically set it up so that the, um, the dogs would see an interaction between two actors. One actor would give um, an object to another, um, and they were initially neutral, but when the actor received the object, then they might be happy, they might be angry, they might be neutral, and likewise, the re receiver would change. And the way we designed it is, th the dogs then had to choose how to get access to um, some treats. In one situation, they could access it themselves, in another, they had to go to one of the actors. And the question was, which one would they go for? And the way we designed it is, the dog 
we could tease out whether or not the dog would go with somebody who was a giver. They'd just seen, you know, one person give something to the other which had made them happy. Or whether they would go with the person's emotion. Would they go with a happy person even if they were giving, losing something or whatever? And would they avoid an angry person even though they were receiving it? And what we found was, and, and we're still analysing some of the data, we have published the first bit, but th to me the thing that really jumped out was the dogs read people's emotion more, or they prioritised people's emotion over their motivation. Now you might think, wow, that's pretty sophisticated. But actually, the whole point of emotions is that they have a communicative value. I mentioned that in the first talk, that one of the, you know, um, four components that we look at is communication. Understanding in motion, at least at a basic level, tells you, should I approach you or avoid you? And that's really important because that could be sort of have a high cost. So actually, understanding emotion doesn't involve sophisticated skills. It just involves there being clear signals. And this is what I mean. It doesn't have to be cognitively complex. We, the dog doesn't have to think, hmm, I wonder if you're angry at the moment. Just, I'm going to avoid you, yeah? You're in one of those states where it's not good to go begging for treats, yeah? Or you're in one of those moods where it'd be good to cuddle up to you because things will happen. Um, whereas implying motivation, are you a giver or a receiver in this context and how does that apply? That actually does involve quite sophisticated cognition. And that's not what the dogs were doing. So this is what I mean about dogs being very tuned in to emotion um, and perhaps not as cognitively sophisticated, but they are really good at picking out very small differences. Um, and another feature that we've selected dogs for is um, to use their visual system much more. So they have a wonderful sense of smell. We all know about that. But actually, successful living with humans largely involves ignoring your sense of smell, if you think about it. Um, because, you know, your human smells different every day after they get up, have a shower, put something on or whatever, or change their clothes. Smell is just not a good predictor. Um, and that was also brought home to us by another experiment that we did looking at um, cats. And we trained cats in a tea maze. I will get on to the talk but in, a, in a minute, don't worry. But um, these, are, these, I think, are important things. So a tea maze basically means it's like a letter T. You can go left, you can go right to find a reward. I mean, there were cat flaps either side. And we trained the cats, in if, uh, I'll give you a simplified version, that on one cat flap door, there was a red dot, let's say, that smelt of strawberries. On the other one, there was a yellow dot that smelt of bananas. And they had to learn that one of those signaled that there was a food reward. So for the sake of argument, I'll say that the food treat was behind the red dot smelling of strawberries. And after several weeks, training cats is a little bit more complicated than training dogs, trying to train them not to jump out of the tea maze. But um, they eventually learned the task that, you know, and it could be on the left or right, Red dots, smelling of strawberries, that's where the truth is. And they did that reliably. What we then did is we then crossed over the stimuli. So we now had a red dot smelling of bananas and a yellow dot smelling of strawberries. The question is, which would they use? I.e., which had they learned was the better predictor, the olfactory cue or the visual cue? And much to our surprise, nine out of the ten cats used the visual cue. Now... Because I'm a clinical animal behaviourist, um, as a scientist, you think, oh, great, you know, I've got a significant result. The majority of cats are doing this. I'm actually really interested in the one cat who learned the other way. And, you know, and it makes me wonder what world that cat lives in. If he's prioritising scent over um, visual stimuli, he probably has a very different view of the world than the nine that are using vision over. And if you think about it, about 10% of cats spray. I wonder if that's... I'd love to do some follow-up work on doing that test with cats that spray to see whether or not they're the ones that in that task actually would use the chemical cue in preference to the visual one. Um, so, you know, being successful actually in, as a dog involves learning to use uh, visual cues. It allows rapid interaction in, uh, with, in 
exchange of information. So whilst they might not have the greatest sense of vision, as I said, dogs do prioritize a lot of visual cues. Um, and they pick up. So, you know, I think we all know that if you train a dog, you know, to sit, they learn that the lean, they, they don't listen to this bit, you know? Human voices are incredibly unreliable predictors, but that is brilliant. Yeah, I'll get a treat when you do that, or that. Um, so, as I said, they often prioritize the visual over the, um, over the other senses as well. So, so w w when we sort of look at these things, we often have to sort of try and tease out these various effects. So we've got to be careful about making too many assumptions. So what does grief look like in cats and dogs? There's, there have been a, l a couple of bits of work, and I'll take you through those. Um, some work in the mid-90s and then one much more recently. And then tell you a bit about some ongoing work that we have with colleagues in Portugal, the US, and Italy. Um, looking at uh, the grief response in dogs before talking a bit about grief in companion animals. And please do ask questions as we go along. I doubt that I am going to fill 90 minutes, but you never know. Um, we'll see how it goes. I, I can always tell stories. Um, so, OK. So what do we mean by grief in companion animals? As I said, we've got to step away from the idea that grief in companion animals is the same as grief in us, as I said. Um, and I'm going to... Here's another slight side story. I don't know if any of you know this painting. You might vaguely recognize it. It's quite a famous um, painting. And it goes under three different names. And again, I, th I think there's a lesson here. It's called The Death of Procris a satire mourning over a nymph, or just a mythological subject. Um, and the, the first thing, when I first saw this, the thing that really struck me was just how it captured this dog. And obesity is not a new epidemic, by the way, quite clearly, yeah? But it, it really, you know, there is certainly just something, bear in mind this is, you know, 500 years ago. Um, and as I said, this, this artist was famous for not actually naming his paintings or even signing them. Um, and Procris was a, a, a nymph, and people called it the death of Procris. But actually, when you look at the details of the story, actually Procris dies, and there's supposed to be her partner somewhere around, and her partner's not there. So people sort of said, well, you know, maybe we've been over-specific. And you start to see the analogy with mourning, yeah? So maybe we should just describe it as a satire, which is what this guy with the funny ears is. He's not an elf from Lord of the Rings. He's got goat's feet. Um, it's a satire mourning over a nymph. What exactly the fat dogs in the background are doing is another story, but that's... Um, and we'll just describe it. But then I thought, well, maybe we should just call it a mythological subject. And maybe that's what grief is. Maybe grief is just a mythological subject. I actually think the second one is probably the best description. You know, we've got various characters. We've got looks almost certainly like a nymph. We've got a satire. And there seems to be some mourning going on. And in the same with grief in animals, it's not a mythological subject. It, people might think it's mythological to talk about the idea of grieving in animals. But as I said, there's some good biology behind it and to reasons why we might expect that they might. But equally, we don't want to be so over-precise and actually make assumptions that aren't really there in the detail. So that's my analogy and also my art lesson for you today. So when we think about when we lose a loved one, there are going to be a range of changes that can occur, and they can occur for various reasons, and this is why it's important to go back to first principles. It could be that there are changes associated with the loss of the individual, i.e., because that individual is no longer in the other animal's life, its life has changed um, because of that. So, for example, it might be that the animal that died used to provide protection. It might have been that it was the parent of the animal that was left. So now they, um, you know, they've got to take on a new role. In which case, there will be inevitable changes simply because the social dynamic has changed. Nothing to do with mourning or grief or anything like that. 
there could be a reaction to the loss of that individual, which is what we would talk about in relation to grief. Yeah? Or it could be that, well, now that this, let's say, the old dog has died, the owner feels they can take the younger dog for longer walks. So there's a change in its routine, which is nothing to do specifically with the loss of the individual. It's about the fact that it's a different environment. So, you know, we've got various reasons why we would expect there to be behavior changes. And that's quite apart from anything about the changes in the owner's behavior, uh, reactions to the dogs which might trigger it as well. But looking at it, as I said, grief itself is primarily an emotional reaction. Um, the cognitive element, how much it's, it, it's thought about and how we relate to that um, will vary with individuals. Um, and, you know, I don't know, you know, um, I've lost both my parents and my wife's lost both of hers. And I have no idea how she really uh, thought about it. I mean, we obviously did talk about it, but it's a very difficult thing to express. And we really don't get much insight. But we do know that people react very differently. And you know, the best advice I've given to my kids when, we l when they lost their grandparents was, whatever you feel, just accept. Because it's easy to get caught up with too, many, too much thoughts. And that will vary enormously with individuals. But it will vary, that cognitive element will vary with species as well. So as I said, I don't think dogs and cats think that much about it but I do think that they have an emotional reaction, and I'll explain what I mean by that. You don't have to have a concept of death to grieve, though. Because actually thinking about death is a cognitive process. So I'm not talking about the animals um, thinking about their own uh, mortality or anything like that. That's not required for this. So, as I said, we just got to refer back to this picture, make sure that we don't impose things that aren't actually there in the first place. So this is from a few years ago. And this is a fairly typical thing, and, and this sort of illustrates the point to a degree. And so this is the, the video of uh, Brutus is the, the, the Rottweiler here, and this is his sibling who died. And the owner videoed this about um, sort of uh, how his dog was grieving over the loss of his sibling called Hank. And, you know, Hank is dead. Um, and, you know, of course, the newspapers get hold of it and they talk about the dog crying. Now, you know, Rottweilers often have wet eyes. <laughs> um, so whether or not there's anything like that, but interestingly, there has been recent work that has shown that the tears um, produce oxytocin. And oxytocin is a chemical involved in social bonding. Um, and when animals are exposed to a range of emotional situations, they actually seem to increase tear production. And we, they think that it might have a role in that communicative function. So having said they learn to use vision over smell, actually they may be tick picking up on things like oxytocin um, with the watering of the eyes. But, you know, the, the owner of the dog is clearly upset that he's lost one of his dogs as well. But I think both of these dogs were, were um, rescues um, and they'd lived, lived together for a while. But the reality is, how much of this dog's... I have no doubt that um, Brutus went and sort of laid on Hank, but how much of the behaviour now of Brutus is being reinforced by being stroked by the owner in that situation? And the answer is, I don't know. But this is what I mean about being careful about what we read into it in that situation. The, the Actually, what didn't come through is there, there is a... The owner is talking to the dog as well in... Uh, and that he sort of talks about it's okay and whatever and you don't know how much the dog is picking up on those cues and, and again to go back to what I was saying at the beginning we've got to be so careful dogs will pick up on cues and they will do you know what works for them 
and might seem appropriate without necessarily thinking it through. So, you know, um, and I don't have a problem, as I said, with unmasking the magician. Uh, I find it interesting in, oops. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's, if the mouse is on it, if the mouse is on it, then it plays it again. Um, and this is where I think looking at wild populations is quite important. Now, I'm not one of these people who believes that in order to understand dogs, you need to understand wolves. If you, know, if you want to understand dogs, go and watch dogs. But certainly, sort of back into the mid-90s, people started reporting that wolves seem to show um, various responses uh, in relation to the loss of another. So there's also a report round about this time of a female wolf who lost her partner who just who's being actually tracked, and they could track her, and she went into environments she had never been before, and she went away for an, a, an extended period of time before returning to the, to the group. Um, this, this report relates to um, the burying of wolf pups. Oh, that wasn't me. Um, so, um, so, you know, in, in this situation, you know, this isn't going to be reinforced by owners or anything like that. Mm. Clearly, the animals are responding to some loss, and in this case, the loss of a, a dependent. Um, and are they caching it? Um, are they burying it? Because they could be just caching it, you know, in, in effect, as food for later on. Who knows? Um, but this is what I mean when we think about grief as an emotional response. Um, so when we look at the sort of basic emotional systems that uh, animals have and the approach that we take is we many of you will be familiar with the work of Yak Pangsep which has been very influential in many fields including our own but rather than think about emotional circuits or, or effective systems as discrete circuits we actually um, view the emotions as states of the brain and we think of the emotions as having functional value and there's a very good reason, biological reason, to argue why animals might suffer um, a response to loss. And it depends very much on what we call the attachment system. And by attachment system, I don't, th the word attachment is used in many different ways. And this is, this is as you all know, I'm sure, the language that is used in, in our field often is ambiguous and it has multiple um, potential meanings. So, um, by when I use the term attachment, I mean a, a, um, an emotional bond which is based on the provision of safety and security. The classic example of that type of bond is the bond that exists between an infant and their care provider, typically the mother in the case of mammals, but not always. Um, and that's the bond because the mother protects the infant. So a pup is attached to the bitch, but actually the bitch has a different relationship with the pup because it, she doesn't see the pup as providing safety and security. She has an emotional bond, but a caregiver's bond. And, and I would characterize that slightly differently. But so to understand attachment is, attachment is the emotional bond that emerges from gaining safety and security from another individual. And the interesting thing about attachment is that attachment, whether it be for the safety and security or even if it be uh, attachment to a location, it seems to be underpinned by opiates, opiate systems that are really important in strengthening that bond. What that also means, though, if you think about it, is if that bond gets broken, you're going through opiate withdrawal. You're going cold turkey, if you know the expression, yeah? Which is why it hurts. You know, if, you, if you're going through opiate withdrawal, then all the pains and everything get magnified as well. So, you know, th and this is why I think this is, you know, also an important topic, because we're talking about a big welfare issue here as well. But, as I said, certainly the attachment system would predict that when an animal loses a 
uh, an attachment figure, then they are going to suffer quite a lot and show a range of emotional responses. And this system also underpins some separation-related problems. So mentioned this morning about uh, you know when you leave your if you leave your dog alone, then if the dog doesn't know that you're coming back, then potentially this system can kick in, and rather than being depressed, they might respond more actively, uh, and that in which case we sometimes refer to it as the panic system, and the dog can become quite destructive. The destructiveness we've looked at, and it looks like actually a lot of what we see by way of damage and responses like that actually relate more to frustration. So the animal might be trying to get to the owner, but the door is in the way, and, and therefore um, it, just, it attacks the door. So there's the frustration. So you've got the, the panic from the loss of the individual going after the individual, and then you've got frustration. And this is starting to shape the way that we manage separation-related problems by focusing much more on the, the frustration element as well as the nature of the relationship. Um, so, but in other situations, the animal is in an enclosed area. It, ca it can't get through the door. And so it is frustrated and unable to escape. And so you get a lot of displacement and redirected behaviors, in which case you get destruction of other items. So that tells us about how the animal might be processing the frustration in that situation. When we think about this sort of system in relation to grief, we're generally thinking about the animal becoming more withdrawn. And as I said, and th the animal's personality may be quite important in this. But the attachment figure is a provider not just of key resources, not, you're not just, you, sh you don't want to be just your dog's food machine, you provide safety and security. So it's a focus of dependencies. Um, and as I said, that can be quite important when we think about it. So. That individual, the attachment figure, we sometimes refer to as a secure base, and then you've got the dependent, which is the one that is attached. So the attachment bond is the relationship between that dependent and the secure base. Does this make sense? The relationship between the secure base and the dependent is not what I would call an attachment. It doesn't mean there can't be elements of attachment within it, because relationships are not pure. So, for example, in humans, you know, a close relationship between adults often will have an element of attachment. And we know that attachment in children and the attachments they form to their parents very much shape the sorts of relationships they form with later romantic partners. So it's not a question of, well, it's an attachment bond or it's not an attachment bond. Attachment is a feature of a bond, and it's an emotional component within it. The secure base provides safety, security, and essential resources. That's what they do, and, and we might want. And they are motivated emotionally to do that through a caregiving bond. It makes them feel good. I mentioned again this morning, features of the infant, big eyes and whatever, make you want to care for them. That's nurturing. And you know, evolution has resulted in a very neat system that ensures, uh, you know, young, um, we've actually got a, a, a balance between the dependent and the secure base. And there's actually a trade-off, and that's what happens at weaning, in natural weaning situations, that um, during weaning, basically, from an evolutionary point of view, the dependent is trying to get as much as they can off their mum, because milk is cheap, from the dependent's point of view. It's cheap and easy. From the mother's point of view, she wants to get away from the infant because they're starting to become a cost. But having invested so much in your young, you're not going to abandon them. You, know, you wouldn't last very long as a species if you did that. So you have this trade-off. And this is one of the reasons why, for example, milk in many species is short on iron. Because in that dep depriving the young of a little bit of iron actually encourages them to do a bit of foraging. So they start to eat more, so they, become, they eat less off the mother. And the terrible twos, as we call them in humans, you know, that's the classic weaning dilemma. I'm used to getting these resources, and if I kick up a stink, I'll still get them from you. And it's that balance, that trade-off between the mother saying, well, you've got to be a bit more independent versus the infant trying to get as much as they can. And you can actually predict 
and it has been done in a range of species, at what age you know, this weaning will happen based on the nutrition of the milk and various other factors, and you can make these predictions. So there is a tension that exists here, but at the same time, there is this attraction with the mother. You don't want to abandon your infants having made an investment. They are your biological future. So the attachment bond it goes this direction from the dependent to the secure base in, in its purest form. And as a result of that, we get various behaviors. So we will get behaviors from the dependent. They will use the secure base. So if, you, if they have a healthy attachment, we can talk more about unhealthy attachments. That's a slightly separate topic. Um, but if I finish early, I'll, I'll talk more about this in relation to separation-related problems. But assuming they've got a, a healthy attachment, then when the dependent is in an unfamiliar or novel environment, they will use the mother as the basis, or the, the um, I'll, I'll use the term mother, um, simply because it usually is in, in a natural setting, and it's um, as a secure base. So they will work out from her and keep returning to her, because they know that is a safe place. Um, likewise, if they get scared, then they will return to the mother for any reason, and that's a safe haven. And this, is, this was originally, this, these models were developed in humans, and you can, you can set up tests, the Ainsworth Strange Situation Test, for example, where you can actually measure these sorts of responses and start to define objectively. Without having to go into complex cognition, you can say, well, you make these predictions. Um, and the interesting thing is, actually, in separation-related problems, people sometimes talk about hyper-attachment. There is no evidence whatsoever of hyper-attachment. Uh, what looks like hyper-attachment probably isn't. The dogs that um, look like they're hyper-attached do not use the owner <laughs> as a secure base when you actually test them in that situation. It's actually probably a form of dysfunctional attachment, but um, I can talk about that later on. But you'll predict that, as I said, these behavioral responses depending on this relationship. So in the presence of the mother or the secure base, then the dependent should be more willing to explore the environment um, or unfamiliar environments. What that also means is that when that bond is broken, then you lose that effect. So this isn't about mourning the loss of the secure base. This just means I've no longer got my safety net here. So you will see changes in behavior purely as a result of I've lost um, my secure base. Now, that can mean safety and security, but it can also mean I'm losing access to essential resources. Um, and if I lose access to resources, that actually generates frustration. And in animals that are more extrovert, then the frustration side of things may dominate. And as I said, that's what I think that's uh, the work we've done suggests that is what is going on with a lot of dogs with separation related problems. But there is this reduced sense of safety and security. And that can generate this sort of grief or panic type response, um, where the animal might become withdrawn in order to conserve resources, or if it believes that it, its efforts might be rewarded, then it will panic. It will do the opposite. I make a real effort now, and maybe you'll come back. These are the dogs that are howling in, in the hope that the owner comes back in effect. I'm not saying they're thinking it through in this way but they're making the effort to try and restore it. The grief is a signal, basically, of chronic frustration, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to get you back. And it's actually a shutdown of the systems, which we think is associated with conserving energy. But it's a little bit more than that. Does that make sense? It's, it's, I know, I've tried to take it through step by step so that it's logical, but if you've got any questions, please ask now before we move on to the next bit. Okay. Key to this is the temperament traits, particularly of this individual. Um, there is 
there's another bit of the story, which is the way that the mother figure cares for the individual sets the style of the attachment as well. But understanding the temperament is quite important. And as I said at the beginning, dogs are very much predisposed to having very, very quickly forming attachments with people. Um, they have, there is some genetic work that suggests that dogs have almost like a hypersociability gene. Um, um, so as much as you'd like to think that your dog loves you and only you, he does probably love you, but he probably loves everybody else. And if you drop down dead he and somebody else came along and looked after him, he'd probably quickly transfer his allegiances, I'm sorry to say. Um, but he might still grieve you a little bit. Um, um, and this also becomes important with cats as well. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about cats and the temperament and the relationships that form with cats as well. That is going to affect the types of behavior responses that we see. Some may be more outgoing, some may be more withdrawn. So, so if we're going to think about a grief response, there are two <laughs> es essential elements to think about. There needs to be this close affectionate bond, and particularly um, attachment, but some value in that emotional bond, the, the social bond. And I don't think attachment is the whole um, story, but... Um, and then you're going to need a certain personality. Um, and certain personalities may or may not um, be more prone to grieving. Interestingly, and I'll, I'll come to it later on, there is a book on grief in animals uh, written um, by a, uh, a researcher. And she actually says early on in the book, I've never seen grief in my cats. I've got plenty of people who have. And she starts the story with one of her friends and the grief response of their cats. She said, I've never seen it in mine, but I have a very different relationship. I have, in effect, a catio. And my cats live a relatively semi-feral existence out there. Um, so, um, and I think that's, that can be quite important there. So, a close affectionate bond and the personality, I think that is very common in the the dog-owner relationship. Um, it's much more variable in cats. That said, well, you might think, if you look at the data initially, that, oh, it's actually as common in cats, grieving process. This is, a, um, this is a bit of work we did on cat-owner relationships a few years ago, uh, a couple of years ago. And basically, we looked at the relationship, and as I said, when you think of a relationship, you can think of different emotions. You've got the attachment system, you've got the caregiving system. You've got um, what we might call just an affectionate bond, which is the bond between individuals who do things together. So, you know, if you like to um, play computer games, you know, you, you have a common purpose, uh, and that's an affectionate bond, and that, that's another form of, of bonding. You also have romantic bonds, so if you want to reproduce with someone. And we developed a questionnaire looking at cat personality, trying to tease out all these different elements uh, and the various relationships. And what it showed was, at a top level, there seemed to be three types of relationship, but two of those subdivided into two other types of relationship, which I will show you now. And this gave us five different types of cat owner relationship. And when we, when we did this, the, the student, Mauro Innes, who's the first author of the paper, I mean, he was just brilliant. He got thousands, we got literally, we got, I think, 6,000 people to respond to the initial mm -hmm. survey. And the university loved it, and they did a press release, and they developed an app um, so that people could assess um, their relationship. And basically, you've got what we call the distant bond, which is your group A, which are basically these cats that um, there's very little owner investment, emotional investment in the cat. The cat is accepting of others, so he's relatively independent in that he doesn't show much need specifically for the owner, and he's quite aloof. Um, and that's one group. The second group we called the distant bond. And these ones... Um, the owner doesn't have much emotional investment, and the cat is not accepting of others. Um, doesn't have need for the owner, but
but <coughs> equally, it's not terribly aloof. So there, there is a bond there, but it seems to be relatively distant. The third group is the remote bond, where the cat is... Um, uh, sorry, the casual bond, where the cat has many of those previous traits, but actually accepts others. So he's the one who goes around everybody's neighborhood and gets fed from them. Thank you very much. Yeah? Um, and of course, I love you like no one else. Oh, time to go to the neighbor and go and get food from them. The fourth group is the codependent. So this is a heavy emotional investment by the owner, and it seems that a similar investment by the cat that is reciprocated. And then the fifth one is the um, friendship, uh, where there's not such great dependence, but clearly there is a, an affectionate bond between them. Now, the remarkable thing about this is um, when we did this, as I said, the university did a press release and they developed an app and I was told that 95% of the traffic coming to the university <laughs> that the week we launched that was for people to play this <laughs> app. <laughs> so we have thousands of data. And the even more remarkable thing, and Barbara will appreciate this, as a scientist, often you do something and people say, oh yeah, but that's not true because my, it doesn't apply to my dog. And you just think, yeah, your dog is one. We, we, we're not talking about every single... I got loads of emails said, this is so accurate. You know, I've never had so many people say, wow, this works. And, you know, people seem to identify with this. My suspicion is, it, when you talk about griefing cats, it's these codependent bonds. I also want to now start using this to look to see the sorts of behavior problems with the relationships, because I can make certain predictions, and we'll start to see it. But as I said, so... I think it's certain types of cats, and maybe the people with a codependent bond and the friendships are more likely the people to take part in surveys as well. So when you look at the data from the surveys that I'm going to come to in a, a little while, you'll see that the responses of cats seem to be as common as the responses in dogs. But remember, these are surveys. And so you've probably selected for a typical type of cat owner. So I don't think it is as common in cats as it is in dogs. Um, okay, so so look at the reactions. Well, they can be. We can classify the reactions as reactions towards the figure of loss. So, the dog has lost his mate. How does he respond to that individual? The sort of thing you saw with Hank in the the, the Rottweilers. There's reactions towards themselves, which is perhaps the depression and things like that. And then you've got reactions towards others, which, as I said, might be as a result of grief, but it might just be because um, there's a change in the social dynamic now. Yeah, but We can broadly divide it into those three classes, I think, in order to try and make sense of what is going on. So we'll think about grief-related behavior in relation to each of these. And if you are interested in this book by Barbara King, it's, it's an easy-to-read book. Um, but um, it's not written by somebody who's just sort of trying to sell you the idea that uh, animals are grieving terribly and uh, cognitive. Sh you know, she really does explore the issue, I think, in, a, in an interesting way. There are a number of biological theories concerning the function of grief. Um, and it might be that it's not one or other, it might be that it's all of these. I've already indicated that if you've got a strong attachment, then grief is almost inevitable cost of having that attachment. So in order to have the benefits of safety and security, when you lose that object, of your attachment object, inevitably you, you go through the withdrawal of that process. So it's not then necessarily that functional, other than the fact it allows you ultimately to move on and perhaps develop another attachment later on. So th that's what we call the inevitable cost argument. And as I said, this doesn't involve sophisticated cognition, so there's no reason to think that this wouldn't be widespread amongst animals that have attachment bonds, so animals that care for their young. In some species, it's been argued that actually, by grieving, you demonstrate 
that you have strongly bonded to that individual that you've lost. So this is where grief, particularly uh, with a romantic partner, and in effect, whether it be a romantic partner or whether it be an offspring, what you demonstrate is that you're a good partner or a good carer. That makes you attractive then to other individuals, which increases the chances of you being able to reproduce in future, and that's the biological advantage, yeah? So it's a way of signaling, I'm a good mother, or I'm a good father, or I'm, um, I'm a good husband, or I'm a good wife, in effect. Um, so after that loss, it uh, means that you, won't, you have a potential to bond with somebody else. A third theory around this and, um, looks at the issue of, um, says that by grieving, that brings the group together, those that were that had a bond with that lost individual, um, and it makes that group stronger at a time when they would be vulnerable. If you've lost an important figure in your social group, your social group is at danger of splitting. And if your group splits, you lose all the advantages of group living. So grieving may serve to actually cement the bond. So as I said, none of these require sophisticated cognition. And that's why you know, I think we, we should be confident that animals, uh, many animals may actually go through a grieving process. OK, so let's, what do we know about the grieving process? Well, as I said, in the mid-90s, the American Society for the Protection of Cruelty of Animals did a thing called the Companion Animal Mourning Project. Unfortunately, you I cannot find a copy of it, so I've had to take information from various websites to try and find out. But these, and this looked at cats and dogs, and these were the sorts of signs that were reported. Changes in vocalization, barking, howling, meowing, more or less, actually. Um, eating less, restlessness or sleeping less, acting sluggish or sleeping more, seeming disoriented or confused, avoiding contact or play with other family members and becoming clingy. And like I said, you can look at these signs and start to think about them in terms of, well, how much of those are directed and how might some be reinforced? But the key thing here is these are also signs of pretty non-specific illness. So I think an important take-home message here is if an owner reports that their pet seems to be grieving, get them into the vets to have a check because they might actually have a coincidental medical issue. Um, it's easy to lose sight of those signs as well. So we have an important role there um, just to check that things are okay. And this is what I mean when I say, when you look at the figures, they look quite similar. So 65% of cats showed four more changes in behavior, and they say 66% of dogs showed several behavior changes. But I don't think that's a true prevalence in the population. I think that's because of the sort of the cat owners that take part. About half the cats ate less, and in very extreme cases, the cat was reported to have starved itself to death. 36% of dogs ate less, with more than 10% stopping eating altogether. 70% um, of cats changed their meowing or vocalization habits. 65% of dogs. Most cats changed their sleep related. Um, many dogs slept more than normal, um, but some be um, became sleepless as well and started to sleep in different locations. And 50% of cats became more clingy and very often that was seen in dogs as well. So it seems that the profile of responses is quite similar between the two species. We'll come back to that in a, in a minute. So, and again, moving on, this is a video footage of a dingo um, who has lost a pup. And you can see she picks up the dead pup and she kept moving the body around and they recorded the behavior of both the um, female but also the pups and they seem to show responses to it. And again, you know, this takes away the element of the human reinforcement um, of that. Um, so we aren't seeing those sorts of responses and these are obviously responses directed at the immediate loss of that individual. What is going through her head at that time? I have no idea. But you're clearly seeing a response to an individual that has died, whether or not the mother has any concept of it. Oops. 
and these are a number. So that, that you know, the, the dead pup was moved around. You can see the other pups were investigating it um, in, in various places. Men some of you may know this guy, Marty Becker. If you familiar with Marty Becker and Fear Free? Um, he's, he's most well known for, yeah, uh, you know, <laughs> promoting Fear Free. What you might not know is he's also a very um, strong advocate on um, mental health issues um, and uh, grief in particular. And that actually relates to the death of his own father who committed suicide. And the, s the story goes that Marty bought his father a schnauzer called Pepsi and the two were inseparable. Um, and as I said, sadly, his father committed suicide. And um, the, the dog could not be um, sort of, the dog, um, I'm not sure if the dog was with him when he committed suicide, or, but he certainly got access to the body and they couldn't really do anything. And the story goes that Pepsi actually starved herself to death. Um, um, it's one of the few documented cases of a dog starving themselves in, in that regard. Whether or not there was something else going on, but you know, Marty is a vet, so you would have thought that he would have looked into it. Um, so you, know, you do get these instances where it can have very serious um, consequences. So looking at some of the recent, more recent work, and I said there's a couple of studies, uh, this one from uh, New Zealand and Australia, and one of the things that comes through from this is, and often people say, oh, should I let the animals see the body? And both studies, uh, this one and um, the work we've done, this doesn't seem to be any effect of seeing the body on the likelihood of a grief response. Now, that doesn't mean it's not useful, but it's not going to affect the likelihood of the grief response. I actually think it is perhaps useful for the animals to see it, so they've got something to process you know, this other individual is no, is no longer going to respond to them. So this is based on about 150 dogs and 150 cats. Just for future reference, the dog columns are in blue, the cat columns are in red. Where the colour gets darker, that means an increase. Where they get paler, that means it's a decrease. And where they're very faint, that means the behaviour's probably stopped. So if we look at changes in feeding behaviour, then, yeah, the majority, there's no effect. But there is a proportion, just below 10% of cats and dogs, who eat more. But between about 20% of cats and 35% of dogs actually eat less. And this is the difficulty, as I said, this is why understanding the personality is important, because, you know, some will eat more, some will eat less. Um, and we don't really know. If you average sort of across the population, you'd probably say there was no change in eating behavior. But as clinical animal behaviorists, we're interested in those individuals, as I said, that are, are different. And a small proportion seem to stop altogether for a while. Speed of eating, vast majority no change. But actually, in the case of dogs, around about 30% of them actually ate their food more slowly. Um, and around about 10% of cats did the same. The interesting thing that came out of this study, though, was about 9% of them, nearly 10% of the animals that showed the grief response, the changes resulted in a uh, change in their health. So again, you know, as vets, I think we do need to be monitoring these cases as well and make owners aware of these possibilities. If we look at the sleeping behavior, again, you know, the majority don't change of those surveyed, but these are not necessarily representative samples. You're just going to keep that in mind. So we're more interested in these, these relative distributions here. So, um, you know, dogs are more and cats are more likely to increase their sleeping, but about for every two that increase their sleeping, perhaps one will reduce their sleeping. And interestingly, um, the sleeping area was avoided by about 15% of dogs and cats where the previous um, animal used to sleep. If we look at changes in vocalization, then in the case of cats, an increase in vocalization seems to be uh, much more common 
uh, effect. You do see it more in the dogs as well, but it seems to be, as I say, particularly common in cats, although some will uh, vocalize less um, and some will stop. If you look at the volume, i.e. Oh. how loud they are, then again, the cats are not only meowing more, but they're also doing it more loudly as well in those situations, whereas a small proportion do it less. Elimination behavior, well, again, you know, here it's quite common that there is a change in urination and defecation behavior. It is increased in both the cats and dogs, but also quite a substantial proportion, 20% or so, uh, may reduce. Um, and a relatively small proportion will start to eliminate in a different position, uh, location. And again, that could mean that they now start developing a house soiling problem. So we need to just be aware of that when, if an owner comes to us and sort of talks about their cat or dog developing a house soiling problem. If you're aware, especially that they've recently lost another pet in the home, then that could be related to it. Changes in aggressive behavior, vast majority, no real change, but a small proportion um, uh, do increase their aggressivity, possibly associated with mood effects. Cats more likely to become a little bit more aggressive towards other animals. But generally, the aggression towards humans is quite unusual that they become aggressive towards them. If we look at the affectionate behavior, then, yeah, you know, both dogs and cats, a lot of them will become, um, show more affectionate behavior towards the owner. Um, a proportion, 10, 15% may show less, but um, a good proportion, they, the increase is to the point where the owner describes them as quite clingy, um, where they can't leave the animal, perhaps in 25% um, of the cases there. And a small proportion actually become avoidant in, in that situation. If you look at changes in the use of the home space, um, so this is now sort of, well, the animal has come out of the uh, home, so, you know, what is going on? A proportion will increase hiding, 10-15%. Um, seeking higher areas, not surprisingly more common in cats than in dogs, but you do see it there. Um, seeking the spots where the deceased used to hang around, that's quite common. You know, a third of the cats and dogs or more. Um, and avoiding the areas, perhaps 5 or 10%. So, you know, it's important to be aware of these figures so that we can advise owners, um, you know, about these situations of what to actually expect and reassure them that this is normal. Um, so, as I said, and it looks like we get similar responses in cats and dogs uh, to a large extent. The Morning Dog Project, as I said, is a bit of work that we've been doing with um, colleagues um, in Italy. And Stefania is the person who's really heading up most of this work. And this is just focused on dogs. We don't know about cats, but given everything that I've said so far, I wouldn't be surprised if the same applied to cats, because th their responses seem so similar to dogs in so many other ways. Um, so it is not something special about the, the dog. And if, as I said, you can read the first of the papers here. So again, we just have to be aware that these are not necessarily representative samples, but a good proportion of people uh, report no changes in their animals. I think one of the interesting figures here, though, is that when changes are seen, for about a third of them, the signs go on for about up to two months. Um, for about 40% of them, they go on for perhaps up to six months. And for nearly a third of them, they can go on for over six months. Um, and, you know, I would say that we should be intervening much earlier in a lot of these cases. There's no effect of gender, including neuter status, on the likelihood of the responses, the age of the, um, of the animal that was left behind when the other one died, the breed. And again, no effect of viewing the, the dead animal in this situation. And interestingly, the duration of the relationship didn't predict any of the responses that we saw as well. 
So, you know, it's about the quality of the relationship, not the quantity of the relationship. We measured a number of owner-related factors because, as I said, there is a danger that perhaps the owner is projecting on. And we used the Lexington attachment to pet scale to look at the owner attachment. Um, we used a, a scale to assess the owner's vision of life, uh, the positivity scale, and also one about how they represent death, um, and uh, looked at how they represent pets versus humans in a continuity of things as well. And the interesting thing was that the overall scores from these scales did not predict the behavior changes. And to me, that was one of the most exciting findings because it suggests that these are not just owners projecting their emotional state. You know, these things are not happening. It's not that they were more attached and therefore they believed that their, their pets would be more attached. They're not projecting their own feelings into their evaluations of the dog's responses. Whoops. So, so we've got the various types of responses that occurred here. And what I'm going to show you is the factors that seem to relate to this. So yes, we've got increased in vocalization, which affected around about 30%. And you'll s these values are the same on every graph. But the factors that predicted is slightly is, is different that we're looking at. Reduced eating, yes, there's about. 30% there. Increased fearfulness, about 30% reported that. Increased sleeping, uh, reduced activity, about 45%. Reduced play, about 55%. Increased attention seeking, about 65%. So it, it's relatively similar in the distribution compared to uh, the previous study as well. The duration of the relationship did actually um, um, sorry, having said duration didn't affect the overall scores, but it did affect things like increased sleeping. Um, dogs that had longer relationships, they um, were more likely to increase sleeping when they lost the individual. Uh, they were more likely to reduce activity and also to uh, reduce play. If the relationship was described as friendly between the two dogs, then Again, we, s we are more likely to see an increase in sleeping, a reduction in activity, a reduction in play, and an increase in attention seeking from the owner, which would suggest that having lost their partner, maybe they're starting to focus now on the uh, owner in that situation. But the friendly relationship had no effect on vocalization, eating, or fearfulness. Are you okay there? Did you, did you want anything clarified? or? You okay? If they describe the relationship between the two dogs as more like a parental relationship, that caregiver, care receiver, the interesting thing I think here, just going back to the attachment, you s this predicts most of the behavior changes, yeah? With the exception of the sleeping, all the others were affected by that parental relationship. Unfortunately, we don't know which way the, that parental relationship went um, in these cases. But what it suggests is, is you know, having a parental type relationship, having that attachment bond involved in the relationship is a strong predictor of <laughs> behavior changes. The animals just being friendly, they might still have a, an air element of safety and security. That has less of an effect. So, you know, they grieve more when they've lo when a relationship that's similar to a parent offspring is broken than when they just lose one of their mates. Um, interestingly, if the relationship between the two dogs was described as agonistic, they didn't get on very well, or they just tolerated each other, that didn't have any effect. It didn't increase or decrease the risk of it. And I actually find that quite interesting, that it, it, it's not that, you know, I wouldn't expect those to have a positive effect, but they didn't have a negative effect either. So there's this sort of, um, <coughs> it, it, it does seem to be very much related to the, the grief 
is the loss of a positive relationship. And these responses are responses of loss, not yippee, got rid of him. Um, if we now take the data and look at how the dogs shared resources before uh, one of them died, if they shared sleeping areas, then the dogs were more likely to reduce their activity and reduce play after the loss, but no effect on the other factors. If they tended to fight, then they would tend to reduce play. And I think this raises the interesting question as to were owners interpreting the fighting as play fighting? Maybe it was play fighting, and maybe that's what was going on. I, I, uh, but um, as I said, because the agonistic relationship doesn't predict it, but the, f the fighting does. If they tended to groom each other, we saw more widespread effects. So again, this reinforces the importance of behaviors like grooming in identifying close social bonds. Um, it's one of those things that we often look for. Um, and if animals groom each other, then it generally means they've got a, a close bond. And that means that, you know, it's not surprising then that when you lose one of them, that it's a more severe loss, a particular relationship. Whereas if they shared play, there is an effect on three of those measures, sleeping, activity, and play. But again, it's this grooming that has the biggest effect. So we might think that, oh, play is the sign of the sort of animals getting on, but actually it's probably the mutual grooming um, of each other that may be a, a better indicator. So I think, you know, one of the interesting things that tumbles from this is, again, just understanding the nature of relationships and what might be important in assessing um, quality of bonds between individuals. So if we now look at the effect of shared activities, um, if they shared food, well, um, they were more likely to reduce eating when one of them died, increase sleeping, reduce activity, and reduce play, which sort of goes with the idea of energy conservation, you know? Um, so the shared food, um, when they've lost that individual, then uh, that seems to have these knock-on effects. Shared resting areas, similar sorts of effects as well. Shared toys, slightly different profile, This perhaps this attention-seeking. But maybe, again, this is the transference of sort of, well, I used to play with the other dog, and now I want to play with the owner in that situation. So that's the way that I tend to interpret that. If we look at the owner's feelings, um, and you could use certain subscales within the pet bereavement questionnaire and the Lexington attachment. Whilst there was no overall effect, what we found was that owners who were scoring higher on grief were more likely to have dogs that reduced eating or increased fearfulness. Um, so it does seem that there is an effect of the owner's emotional state um, on the remaining dog's behavior as well. Um, and what was interesting was this increased fearfulness was associated with owners who scored higher on a measure of anger in relation to bereavement. Um, and interestingly, because we did this in both Italian and English, Italians were much more likely to get angry <laughs> over the situation, <laughs> just to fulfill that uh, Mediterranean stereotype. Um, and the dogs are more likely to become fearful. Um, I don't think it was an, an Italian effect. I think it was the uh, anger effect that we were seeing here in that situation. But there were no effects of owner guilt or attachment level or the extent to which they thought of um, their dogs as little people substitutes, um, which again, I think is quite important when we think about you know, the argument, oh, well, you know, people are just projecting their own feelings onto the dog. That is not the case. And that this is why, you know, I think there's a lot of stigma for owners to talk about this in case they think they're going to get labelled as, well, you're just being silly, yeah? And I think we need to reassure them that animals do grieve. Uh, you will grieve and your animals will grieve. And this is what we need to do. So, what am I doing for time? Okay. Um, this is, if ever you go to Japan, to Tokyo, there is a, a, um, a Shiba station. And it's uh, named after this professor who used to, his dog used to walk with him to the station each day. 
Um, and um, it would wait for him to come home at the end of the day. And sadly, the professor um, died. Uh, he had a heart attack and died at, at the office. And uh, the dog still went every day for 10 years afterwards. And that is verified. That's not a Greyfriars Bobby. That was the same dog. <laughs> um, and there's, so there is a, both a statue of the dog outside the station. This picture is not of the dog outside the station because there's always people standing around it. This is actually on the uh, vet school campus um, of Hachiko Enyo, Professor Enyo and his dog being greeted in that situation. So how should we manage it? Well, as I said, if we understand that the prerequisites of a close affectionate bond and a certain personality, if we're going to do something about personality, that suggests that we may have to intervene at a physiological level. Um, we also need to think about the types of reaction, whether we're looking at reactions towards the figures of loss. So is the dog responding or the cat responding to the particular individual? Is it... A is it self-directed or are we dealing with behaviours of others? And um, this, is, uh, this is another sort of tragic story. This is one of the Navy SEALs that was um, shot down and killed. And at his funeral, his pet dog, halfway through the service, walks to the front and, and lays at the foot of the coffin. Um, and this was, this was his pet dog. And the pet dog had not seen him. Had never had not seen him dead. Um, you know, he'd gone off, go, gone into the field. The dog was brought to the funeral, and the dog uh, apparently sought him out. Whether the dog was responding to odor cues or anything, we don't know. But um, as I said, they're very in tune. So, if we think about reactions towards figures of loss, um, well. We might expect things like vocalization and howling, um, especially to indicate... If so if an owner complains that their dog has started to howl um, or their cat has started to meow a lot, it may be trying to seek out the other. And this is why, uh, as I said, um, sort of they're, they're making an active attempt still. So they're more in that panic mode in trying to bring the individual back. Yeah? What's important is that we don't want to inadvertently reinforce this behavior. It's perfectly natural for an owner who's lost their dog um, and their other dog starts howling that they try to console it. But in which case, you're training your dog to howl. You may well prolong the situation. So, you know, what we have to do, one of the exercises we encourage people to do is to act as a secure base and a safe haven. And what that means is you acknowledge the animal's uh, behavioral reaction, in this case it's grief, and then you show through your own behavior that everything is okay. It's really critical that you acknowledge the animal. When it comes to things like, um, you know, dogs that are scared, you read in the books and people sometimes say, oh, well, you know, ignore the, ignore the dog's fear. From the point of view of development of attachment bonds, that doesn't show any recognition of the suffering of the other individual, and that doesn't help in the development of a secure attachment, a healthy attachment. So it's important to acknowledge an animal's fear, and then your own behavior demonstrates everything is OK, and there's various ways that we can do that. If I've got time, I will uh, come back to that. But make sure you don't reinforce. Cuddling down with the dog actually potentially indicates that you need safety and security. Dogs read emotion. Remember I said at the beginning, they don't read cognition. And so your body language, the dog will read the emotional content of that, and that's why and uh, we encourage owners not to console, but to actually sort of go on a more jolly routine. So even though seeing the body doesn't seem to have an effect on the nature of the grief response, I think it's reasonable to suggest that if an owner asks, that I don't think it's going to do any harm um, for the survivor to see the body of the deceased if it's safe to do so. Um, I think it's important that if you're going to do this that they can introduce it when the owner um, is calm. And it might be better as the veterinarian to offer to bring in the other dog for them because they're likely to be in a bit of a state. Let them, let them have a cry and say, if you'd like to bring in your other dog or I'll bring in your other dog once you've had a chance, if you want to sit in the back room and I'll give them the chance to. So you take control of that situation just to make sure there isn't that reinforcement. So, because I think if they are going to assimilate any information, it allows them to do so in, in that um, situation. Um, and as I said, so I 
do recommend that it, it's supervised. Um, and let them explore in their own time. Don't drag the dog away part way through. You know, I think one of the biggest problems that a lot of companion animals and horses have is we just don't give them time to assimilate. Um, you know, you watch people walking their dogs. Dog starts to sniff, and after a few seconds, they drag him away. Uh, we did an experiment a few years ago where we put urine marks, and you know, we took the dog away every five seconds, and the dog would investigate every single one of the urine marks. Same urine sample, just put in different places. If you give it the chance to investigate the first one fully, guess what? You can walk past the other ones. <laughs> it's just those little things can make a big difference, or you're more likely to get that. Um, so allowing the, um, the surviving dog to leave voluntarily when it starts to move away, you might want to lure it with some treats in order to allow it to do that, but you shouldn't physically drag it away. I think that's Im important. Um, and likewise, you shouldn't be consoling like there was in the case of Hank, the video that I showed you of the Rottweiler. Um, people often ask about well, what should we do about the, you know, the old dog's um, toys, etc. I would leave them there for a time and see whether or not the remaining dog wants to, or dogs want to interact with them. And if they don't, you can start to take them away. But if they do want them, let them have them. That, that's absolutely fine. So that's sort of the, the response to the lost individual. If we look about the sort of the sort of more obvious grief response, the reactions to the self, um, as I said, I think these are much more uh, strongly emotional response. We've got a depressive state, which would be sort of social withdrawal, loss of appetite, insomnia, uh, reduced play, dog perhaps or cat being disoriented. Again, make sure they have a medical check because there could be a, a health problem. Um, or they may show more active signs of frustration, so increased irritability and restlessness. And you will see that in a small proportion. But you can understand sort of how that relates to going back to the original slide that I showed you on. Well, if you've got an attachment bond, you will get frustration kicking in. So the second one is much more a frustration-related issue, whereas the first one is a more grief-related issue. Um, as far as successful treatment, as I said, you've got to work out whether you're dealing with frustration versus uh, a grieving-type response. Avoid reinforcement of the situation. Try to maintain routines, especially aerobic exercise and playing with the animals. You know, that can be useful. Um, there are, there is, Actually, a long time ago, I think in the early 90s, there was a case of a, a grieving cat that was treated with fluoxetine. Um, and, you know, the use of SSRIs may be quite valuable in helping the animals to move on. Equally, this may be a case, case where um, the dog appeasing pheromone in the case of dogs and the cat appeasing pheromone in the case of cats may be useful, simply because these are based on the pheromones that the mother produces for the dependents and create a sense of safety and security. That's how we think they work. They're processed chemically in that way. And so they may be helpful in supporting the individual if we think that the signs relate to the loss of safety and security. So they, they may well be helpful in that situation. No, no studies to go on that, but that's just purely theoretical. Um, and one of the other methods that might be useful when you look at the literature is actually providing a dependent for the remaining animal. And owners will say, should I get another dog? Yeah, get one that's uh, but get a, perhaps a youngster. Now, not something that's too... Uh, the reason being that actually if the surviving dog takes on the role of the carer now, that's much more likely to move it on from the grief than if it takes on the role of being the dependent. So getting a young animal might be. Um, where that has been done, it can take several months, um, two to six months. They may initially reject the youngster. There are a few accounts of this in the popular literature, and they may be rejected initially. But ultimately, and it won't be the same relationship as the previous one, but they do go to a healthy relationship. Um, but you can see the rationale behind that, giving uh, sort of 
encouraging the individual to take on the role of care, which will antagonize the um, effects of the withdrawal of the loss in that situation. If we look at the reactions towards others, um, then, as I said, changes in the social relationships, that might be because animals are taking on new roles within the social group. Or there could be, if you've, if you've got multiple dogs that are left behind, depending on what the role of the dog that died, then there may now be some instability in the relationship. So there may be some aggression that results in the remaining ones simply because the hierarchical structure has been disrupted in that situation. What's important is not to contribute to that by being aggressive and punishing individuals. You want to build uh, successful bonds between the animals. Um, and um, again, looking at um, whether or not, as I said, there are uh, signs of increased frustration towards others and poor frustration tolerance, which may need managing accordingly um, and, and manage them. So just to conclude, I think, as I said, the idea of grief in companion animals, and I want to thank Barbara for asking me to give this talk, because it's not something I'd given much thought to. Um, but I think it is a really important issue. Um, and I think it's, it's perfectly reasonable as a biologist to talk about this with our understanding of the psychological and biological nature of the animals that we're dealing with. But that doesn't mean they have the same type of grief that we do, or that they mourn in the way that we do. And we have to be aware that our own response to loss may have a knock-on effect on the animal's behavior. But I think that there's very rational to argue that there is a specific emotional response in the animals. Um, and if we see this sort of grief response in animals, however you want to label it, um, then we should take it seriously. It is a welfare issue. Um, and although most responses are transient, they can be very serious. As I said, there are a number of cases documented of animals starving themselves to death um, and you know we should perhaps should be in intervening and making owners know if we're going to euthanize one of their pets to be prepared for this and that we're there to actually help them um, and don't forget that the owners will be grieving as well and what you didn't see in the first picture is the way to treat grief go to the pub <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much <laughs> Thanks, Danny. Um, yeah, that was a really interesting topic, and I think uh, especially uh, the uh, summary on your last slide uh, um, yeah, puts it all together, what we have to think about when we deal with owners. And I would uh, uh, expand it uh, when we think about behavior problems, and there is a... Uh, a, a serious situation, mostly in aggression cases, between owners and a dog, and it comes to the point that owners have to think about euthanasia or uh, uh, giving the dog to somewhere else. It's about the same situation then. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I, as I said, I think this is something. And again, uh, you know, credit also to Stefania, who's been doing this morning dog project, and we've got more work to turn out from it. But as I said, one of the things that really struck me was just how similar the signs were with cats. So mm -hmm. If the cat is going to grieve, it seems to be a very similar response. And the initial thought was, oh, well, you know, owners are just projecting the same things on cats and dogs, but that just isn't what's going on. And as I say, you look at it as a biologist and you just think, no, there's every reason why this, you'd expect this to occur. <laughs>